the angel said, call his name Jesus. He shall save his people from their sin. And the beautiful name that brought with it, the hope and healing for the whole world. Lord, during this holiday season, more than anything, we bow to worship you in that holy, precious name. Christmas day I stand and say glory glory in the highest in excelsis Deo I pledge to celebrate the meaning of this holiday giving praises to the beauty of your holy name I vow to worship you this Christmas day I stand Today's scripture reading will be taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. And out of respect for God's word, can we stand as we read those verses?
Luke 2, verses 8 through 11. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Um, the Lord in his grace and goodness again has brought us almost to the end of another year. And, uh, you know, Christmas time, right around the corner, we're anticipating, like usual, how you're going to spend your Christmas, what kind of uh, activities you're going to be involved in. And, and uh, some of us have an overly full schedule at Christmas time. But, you know, today I, I do trust that if there's one thing that the Lord will... Uh, lay on our hearts before we leave this place, it is that we become more determined to celebrate this Christmas in a way that will honor the Lord, in a way that will exalt the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us not be afraid nor ashamed to own the Lord. There's a tendency in the world even the so-called Christian world. I don't know if you have picked this up. You're listening to the radio, listening to television and all their programs. Uh, thank God, not all the programs. There are those that are standing firm, flat-footedly on the Word of God. They're not ashamed to own the Lord nor to defend His cause. But there are many who have the opportunity to speak for the Lord and to proclaim who Jesus really is, and they, they stop short. They talk about Christmas. It's as close as they get to Christmas. Um, they talk about holidays. You know, if they can avoid even using the word Christmas, they will. And uh, replace it with holidays and uh, and uh, it used to be Xmas. I haven't heard that word very much of late. But sometimes there are some of us who are in a, in a position of ministering. And we avoid the name of Jesus Christ. We talk about a lot of activity that we're involved in. Inviting people to come and uh, become involved. But leave the name of Jesus out. Don't talk about Jesus. Now, how can you separate Jesus Christ from Christmas? You really can't. And we're only kidding ourselves if we try to do that. We're really not getting anywhere. And God is going to hold us accountable how we celebrate what we call Christmas. Christmas is all about Jesus. Christmas is all about Jesus Christ. And you leave him out, you haven't got Christmas. You have something else. So may the Lord make us faithful to him. Amen? Amen. Always ready to stand up for the Lord Jesus Christ straight and tall. Today, as we ponder a few thoughts about this season, I have entitled our message, uh, cause for celebration. Cause for celebration. And uh, the more I think about this, uh, why do we have Christmas and what's the value of Christmas and should Christians be involved in, in the celebration of Christmas and how far should we be involved? The more I think about it is the more I praise God for having opened my eyes while there is time to understand the value of Christmas. If there was no birth 
of Jesus Christ. Where would we be today? Christmas or no Christmas? Where would we be if Jesus was not around and the thought of him was not there? Well, God in his wisdom, he knows what we need. And so Jesus is very much alive. And I trust we will understand that as we move into our message today and uh, as we come to the close of this service, that we will realize that Jesus is not only alive, but he still is King of Kings. He is Lord of Lords. And he desires to be the King of your life and mine. I want to think with you, or I'm going to ask you to think with me, concerning some causes for Christmas and causes for celebrating Christmas. A few causes. I, I, I've listed about six of them, and I don't know if we'll get through all six, but we will touch on these causes for celebrating Christmas. I was speaking to a, a Christian lady not long ago, and she was somewhat upset. Her own spirit was not just right. And she told me, she says, you know, Brother Charles, I don't believe in Christmas anymore. I said, now, wow, why don't you believe in Christmas anymore? Did you ever believe in Christmas? Yes, but, but I don't believe in Christmas anymore. Um, so we had a little chat about that. And she, I discovered, she was being affected by some, some strange doctrines that were coming in. She was listening to. And uh, she concluded that to celebrate Christmas was not a good thing. That God didn't want her to celebrate Christmas. Well, I hope she has changed her opinion. We had a good, strong argument there. But, but you know something? Uh, as long as you know that the person that you're celebrating, that it is all surrounding a person, not just an event. The event is important, but it is only as important as the person is. And the reason why uh, I'm turned on to celebrating Christmas is because we believe that Christmas is all about the person of Jesus Christ. And if you take his birth out of his life, what have we got left? If you were never born, would you be here today? Well, all right, what are some of the causes um, that we can discover uh, concerning celebrating Christmas? And I'm going to suggest that cause number one has to do with the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that birth brought God to earth in human form. Did you hear what I said? I will celebrate Christmas because... When we do celebrate, as a Christian now, when we celebrate Christmas, we are celebrating the fact that God stooped down to become one of us, like us. He, God Almighty, I'm talking about the God of the universe. I'm not just talking about a God of some religious group. I'm talking about the God who made us. The God who made all we can see around us. The God of the universe. The triune God. He is reminding us of who he is. And if he be the God that we serve, then we ought to lift him high. We ought not to be afraid or ashamed to lift him up and bow before him 
for he deserves our worship, he deserves our praise. So when we think of Christmas, we think, number one, we think of the birth of Jesus Christ, who literally brought God to earth in human form. If there was no Christmas, if there was no birth of Jesus Christ, there would be no uh, understanding that we would have concerning God himself. For Jesus came so that we might be in touch with God, so that we might understand who God is and the love he has for us, the plan he has for us. Are you glad that God has a plan for you? Or does he have a plan for you? Come on now, are you following me? God has a plan, not only for us as a group, but he has a plan for each one of us separately. And we need to know who God is, we need to understand what his plan is all about, and we need to honor him when we discover it. So, this is one cause for celebration. We celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ because we recognize when Jesus stooped down to, become, to come to earth and become a little baby and grew up to be a man, God was manifesting himself among us and helping us to understand who he is and what he's all about. You know, I've used this illustration before to make this point, but I think it's a good one. And uh, I think that it helped us to understand who Jesus really is as he stooped down to become man in order that we might understand God's marvelous plan of salvation and in order that he might work out that plan for us. Um, a father and his son was walking along a dusty path. And I guess it must have been around Christmas time. And the little fellow, as, he, as they both walked, the little fellow was holding his father's hand and, and all of a sudden he stopped. And uh, his father had to wait for him to continue. He said, Daddy, look, you just kicked a little ant hill. And look at those ants. Look at them all over. They're, they're, they're troubled. You, you, you broke down their house. Tell them that you're sorry. <laughs> Tell them that you shouldn't, uh, you know, you, you, you're sorry. You didn't mean to to hurt them and you didn't mean to break up their house. The father thought a little bit and then he said to him, his son, his, he says, son, I wish I could tell those ants what you just said. But the only way for me to be able to tell those ants anything, I would have to become an ant. I would have to become an ant so that I can learn ant language and uh, talk like an ant and speak like an ant, you know, for him to understand. But it dry, drove home the point. God wanted to have deeper and closer fellowship and communion with us. He wanted us to understand what his plan, his divine plan really is for us on a long-term basis, short-term and long-term. And the only way he could get us to get our attention is for him to become a man. Does that help us to understand that Jesus Christ was God? Not only was God, he, he is God. He still is God and ever shall be God. Oh, may the Spirit of God just help to drive home that point in our hearts. So we, uh, call, we have cause to celebrate the birth 
of our Lord Jesus Christ, for we believe that in bringing Christ, or in, in dying, not dying, but being born in the earth, on the earth, that Jesus Christ actually was in the place to, to tell us who God is and to explain to us God's plan of redemption. So we celebrate his birth. We celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ also because the birth of Christ was in fulfillment of the prophecies made concerning the coming of Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, we have several scriptures of the Old Testament that made clear God was pointing down the road to when he would send a redeemer. He would send uh, a, a savior to deliver mankind from their sins. And those, those uh, uh, references are, some of them are extremely clear. L let's take the time to look at one of them. In Isaiah, for instance, Isaiah chapter 7, you've read this, I'm sure, over and over. I'll read it for just a couple of verses here. Isaiah chapter 7. You know, Isaiah was one of the great prophets of God. And so God used Isaiah. He told him some secrets and he told him some of his plans. Isaiah chapter, chapter 7, yes. For sake of time, let's touch on verse, um, verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son. Now this is many years before Jesus came. And Jesus was so specific. He, he uses the word, um, a virgin shall be with child. Now that little phrase, by the way, could only apply to Jesus Christ. This is how Jesus came into the world, supernaturally. This was not a natural thing. He didn't come by natural birth. He came by supernatural birth, not having a human father. God himself was his father. Um, so here's the verse. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name. What is that word? Emmanuel. How many of us know what that word means? God with us. He was very God, although he was very man. Does that make sense? Does that make sense with you? That Jesus Christ was not just another man around the corner. Not just another person uh, that came to live with us. Jesus Christ was very God. And he stooped down to take that position that he did take to, in order to bring God to us. And to help us to understand he came with a purpose. And that purpose was to do his Father's will. Um, but there's something else that, that coming of Jesus Christ in that magnificent way, in fulfillment of the prophecies that had to do with his coming, there's something else that seems to strike me. Because if Jesus really came the way that uh, the prophet Isaiah described he would come, come through the birth of uh, being born of a virgin and being called Emmanuel. His name shall be called Emmanuel. If this is really so, this became a fulfillment of that prophetic word, then I am going to suggest to you that that speaks about how reliable the prophecies of God were and are. We can put, you know, you know, you can stake your life on the word of God. 
If God says this is what he is going to do and you see it plainly in his word, watch out, he is going to do it. He's, his timetable may not be the same as yours. His timetable may be somewhat different, but you can stake your life on it. He's going to do it. He's going to carry it through. And I'm just so praising the Lord today that uh, there was a time in my life when that truth became a reality to me. And I now believe beyond doubt that Jesus Christ means what he says, and he says what he means. I trust that uh, as this grabs your heart today, that you will also be willing to celebrate uh, the Lord Jesus Christ because he is reliable, because he is faithful to his word. Amen? And we trust that indeed God will be honored as a result. So we honor the Lord and we celebrate his birth because by means of his birth, God came to earth. God visited us for 32 and 33 and a third years. He visited us in the person of his son. And then we celebrate his birth because it was through the fulfillment of prophecies that Jesus came. He, he was faithful to his word. He was faithful to God his Father. And he came at the right time. This brings us to another point. Jesus Christ came to earth to reveal God to us. But do you know what? He came at the right time. Do you believe that? Yes. He came at the precisely the right time. Um, the Bible uses uh, rather unique language when he speaks, when the Spirit of God speaks about the right time. He did, he, the, the Bible doesn't say that Jesus came at the right time, the time that, that we all had written down that this is when Jesus was going to come. No, God put it this way, and it's, this verse is found in, in Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. This is what God says. When the fullness of time came, I like that. When the fullness of time came in God's economy, Jesus came in the fullness of time. That is, as God designed for him to come. Not as we design. Not as we argue around, you know, trying to make things fit together. No, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. Born of a woman. Born under the law. So that he might redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. And if that's not good news, I don't know what is. Born under the law, but born in the fullness of time. Born to be our redeemer. Born to be our deliverer. And I thank God for such a savior. Amen. Um, and God made no mistake when the time came, when the time was right, he came and there was no stopping him. You remember playing hide and seek as a, as a child after you've hidden and you think you did a good job, you hid yourself away, you shouted out. What is it? Uh, you know, you ready or not, you're going to be caught. You're going to be found out, ready or not. Well, you know, ready or not, Jesus came in the fullness of time. That, that sort of strikes me, though. i come back to this point. But ready or not, Jesus came to earth. Ready or not, Jesus is coming again. Ready? Listen, I trust that 
that will challenge your hearts. If you're not ready, then it means you're not ready for Jesus to come. And you will be disappointed. You will more than, be more than disappointed. You will be upset. And you'll have good reason to be upset. For Jesus Christ is giving to you and to me all the opportunities that we need right now to get right with him. And that is the intent of this message. That we might uh, take advantage of this present moment. This present opportunity that God gives you to say yes to the Spirit of God. To say, yes, Lord, I want this Savior to be my Savior. Amen. I'm going to put my faith in him. I'm going to trust him with all my heart. And I want to be one of his children. Listen, God will change your life if you only mean that from the depths of your soul. So, we celebrate Christmas. We celebrate the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ because the Bible indicates that Jesus was born at the right time. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his Son. He didn't make a mistake. He did it all calculatedly, <clears throat> and he did it in the fullness of time, in, according to his economy, according to his uh, pleasure, Jesus came to be our Redeemer. Clo um, let me share with you another clue. I believe that Jesus Christ should be celebrated because the birth of Jesus took place in spite of the fact that Satan was making attempts to stop him. Do you, do you know that Satan tried hard to stop the birth of Jesus Christ from taking place? Satan knew. Say what you want about Satan. He, he's a bad guy, yes. But I tell you something, he's smart. And he knows a lot of stuff knows more than you and I sometimes think he should know. And Satan, he knew enough to try to stop the person of Jesus Christ from being born. And when he couldn't stop him before his birth, he tried to stop him right after his birth so that he would not grow up and not be a man, and not go to the cross, and not die for us. Anything to stop the blood of Jesus Christ from being shed. He would like to do that. Let me just leave two, two points with you about uh, Satan trying to interrupt God's plan. He tried with the birth of Jesus Christ to prevent Jesus from being born, when, uh, uh, when Joseph and Mary uh, were together, uh, you know, we read about that in Luke chapter 2, and when they came to uh, the place Bethlehem, where this child was ready now to come out of the the, the, the prison that he was in, he, w he was ready to be born. But what do you think happened then? They checked in at the hotel, only to hear, there's no room here for you. No room. You've got to go somewhere else. And there was nowhere else to go. That was an attempt of Satan to try to stop and discourage Jesus Christ from his plan to be here on time. Did that stop him? No, it didn't. Uh, we know, yes, there was no place found in the inn for them, um, and Jesus therefore had to be born in a humble state, in the manger, with the animals around, 
But the big fact is that he was born. And that he grew up. And the word of God tells us he grew up in strength and in knowledge and in wisdom. He kept growing up. And he went eventually as a man. He went to the cross to die in our room instead. I thank God for Jesus. Uh, the more we read about him, the more we remember what he has accomplished for us, the more we ought to love him, and the more we ought to give him the first place of our lives. But then, is that all there is? Is that all the reasons why we should uh, honor the Lord and celebrating? You know, the fact of the matter is that anything you talk about Jesus, you apply anything you can think of about Jesus is good to celebrate. It's good to celebrate. Even the things that are hard to understand. Somebody says, well, how can you celebrate him, for instance, in his death? Do you celebrate him in his death? And isn't that a strange thing? That when, it, when you talk about Jesus, you're talking about the death that he came to die, that was planned for him to die, Jesus Christ could not have accomplished the purpose of his work here on earth unless he went to the cross. He had to go to the cross, but he came as a babe in the manger of Bethlehem with the mindset that the cross was before him. He never lost the vision that God placed upon his own heart. The cross work was what he came to do. And as, as painful and as terrible as that was, when we realize that this was an act that God planned for our good, for our salvation, listen, we ought to be glad to celebrate even the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Word of God reminds us, however, we, those of us who come to the Lord's table to worship God and to tell him, thank you, Lord, for all that you have done for me, you know, that's a very special service and a very special occasion God gives to us. And he says, I want you to keep doing this. I want you to keep celebrating my death until I come again. My brother and sister, it can't be very far down the road that Jesus Christ is going to come again. He is going to come in the fullness of time, just like he did the first time. Um, so, we have Jesus being born, bringing God to earth, that's cause for celebration, we have Jesus being born in fulfillment of the prophecies made in the Old Testament. That tells us of his faithfulness, his reliability. If he says so, he means that that's what's going to be. And that is cause for celebration. It is cause for celebration in the fact that Jesus, the Lamb of God, came to earth in order that he might save us, he might deliver us, that he might redeem us from sin, so that we might have and enjoy an eternal relationship with Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, when this grabs our hearts and souls, it, it, we, 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 we will not be satisfied to just be quiet about it. We will want the world to know that Jesus Christ is our Savior, that Jesus Christ is our Deliverer. He is the one who should have come. He was the one who God designed to come to be our Savior and our Redeemer. And we praise God that is cause to celebrate. Let me give you one more. This one is not uh, something in the past. This is something in the future. 
But as we think of it, we want to celebrate the Lord Jesus Christ in his promise to come again. You know, the Bible indicates exactly how that's going to happen. It's fantastic. And if you don't uh, put your faith in what God says, you'll never really understand it. But God has revealed in his word that this same Jesus that we have been talking about and who eventually left this scene to be, go up back to his father is coming back again. And this is going to be an occasion that we will never forget. That occasion, some, some Bible teachers call it the rapture. You know what that word means, don't, don't you? You won't find the word rapture in the Bible. But you will find the meaning of the word in the Bible. And what does it mean? God speaks about his coming again to snatch from this world all those who know and love the Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus comes, he will in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, snatch his waiting people home. It won't take the time that you can blink your eye. You know, the Bible says in the twinkling of an eye. Is there a difference there? Between a blink of the eye or a twinkle of it? Listen, a twinkle of the eye doesn't even give you time to, for your eyelids to close and open again. No, it's just, just a little inflection of the eye. The twinkling of an eye, and it will all happen already that God's people will be transformed. Um, they, we'd all get a new body, and we'll be transported from earth to heaven in that very short fraction of time. Um, hallelujah is right, brother. I can't wait for that event to take place. You know, this world is becoming more and more ugly. As a matter of fact, it's not the kind of place we really want to be for, for long. Um, the way things are going today, uh, we ponder sometimes how much longer do we have to wait. But we said it before, God's timetable may not coincide with yours. But it's going to happen. Of that we are sure. And um, there is no doubt in my mind that that occasion of the coming of Jesus Christ is just around the corner. Uh, we can't set dates. Some have made the mistake to do that. Uh, that would be a mistake on our part to set a date of Christ's return when he has very clearly expressed no man knows the day, nor the hour, wherein the Son of Man cometh. That is committed to the Father. At the right time, in the fullness of time, God is going to nudge his Son, and he's going to say, go get him. And before that word is out his mouth, he will have snatched us away from this world. What a day of rejoicing, the hymn writer says, that will be. When we all see Jesus, we will sing and shout the victory. Is that an occasion for us to celebrate? We can celebrate the coming again of Jesus in anticipation. It hasn't happened yet, but we know it's going to happen. And we can look forward to that. My, 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 my. If there's one thing that ought to gladden our hearts... It is the very thought that we're not talking about some little story of our fancy here. We're talking about the word of God. We're talking about the promise of God. Jesus himself, when he was being transported from earth, when he was leaving his disciples, he made sure they understood what was happening. So two angels were found standing right by them, and remember the words in Acts chapter 1? 
they, they made it sure that the disciples understood what was happening. He says, this same Jesus shall come again in like manner as you have seen him go. They watched him going. And the word of assurance came from the angels. He's coming back again. And he's going to carry out his promise. And his promises, well, we, can, we, we could take the time to read some of those glorious promises. Um, let me just read one of them, however, uh, regarding the coming of the, the Lord Jesus. First Thessalonians chapter 4 is a portion that all of us should know. And if you don't know it already by heart, then this is an opportunity for you to make a note of it. First Thessalonians chapter 4. And this is what God says. I'm just going to read it from the Bible. And then you can, uh, you can put whatever you want together and put your faith in it. I trust that you will. Um, verse 13, we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren. I'm reading the New American Standard Version. About those who are asleep, or those who die, so that you will not grieve as to the rest who have no as do the rest who have no hope for listen to this for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus for this we say to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself, listen folks, will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. That doesn't mean they're going to get to heaven before we do. But they're going to be awakened. They will rise first. And then, verse 17, we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And listen, folks, this really seals it. And so shall we always be with the Lord. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Does that mean that we are always going to be somewhere in outer space dangling out there? Uh, not being sure. You, some of us are f afraid of heights, huh? <laughs> that doesn't sound too nice. But you know what? Don't, don't, don't deceive yourself. It, that's not what it's talking about. When the word of God says, so shall we ever be with the Lord, it means that we are not going to be parted again. It means we're going to be joined with our Lord at the rapture. We're going to be joined with him. And wherever Jesus goes, we go. We'll never be parted. It won't be a case of... You know, he's up in heaven and we down here anymore. No, we're going to be with him for all eternity. And God is uh, trying to help us to understand that we need to put our faith in what God says. Uh, well, this is only one of the precious scriptures that uh, give us a little, a little peep. <clears throat> in what the rapture is going to look like. But the rapture may take place at any time. It could take place before we say amen here today at this service. Jesus could come. Now let's, for argument's sake, let's just take a moment and do this. Think, if Jesus were to come <clears throat> three minutes from now, if Jesus were to come three minutes from now, what would happen? What do you think would happen? Would we be sitting just the way you're sitting right here now? No. 
what do you think would happen? You know what I think? Part of what would happen, what, what it would look like? I think if Jesus were to come before the service came to an end, all of a sudden, BAM! We'd be gone. Every born-again born believer in Jesus would be gone. If you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, you will remain. You will stay where you are. There's no miracle taking place with you. But every true born believer in Jesus Christ, through the miracle that only God can perform, will be snatched from this world just like that taken away. So what would we have left? You know what I think would happen? We would all of a sudden we'd see just uh, the clothing where Brother, brother uh, Henry, you, are you sitting down there? Just your clothes would be left right there. <laughs> Because Brother Henry would be gone. He don't need clothing up there in heaven. We have the special kind of clothing waiting for us in heaven. Special garments waiting for us. This will wear out. This will soon be outdated, outfashioned. But I tell you, there is something better waiting for God's people. So. All we'd see, little lumps of clothing all over the place. Uh, and the real people gone. Wow! I don't want to see that, for I am hoping to be gone as well. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that with great anticipation. I guess you have heard me say this before, and it still is a, a conclusion that I uh, rely on the Lord doing for me, and that is... I am not hoping to give the undertaker any business. <laughs> I am looking with all my sights set for the upper taker to come and take us from this big, bad, wicked world. Things are not going the way I would like to see it go. No, sometimes my heart is pained when I see what's going on in our world. And sometimes I, I, I have to Ask the Lord, you know, Lord Jesus, how long? How long shall we sing this glad song? But you know, God knows what he's doing. And like we said before, he is not late. In the fullness of time, he that shall come will come. And the Bible says he will not tarry. That is, he won't change his mind. So, uh, what is the challenge that we have before us here? The challenge is, are we willing to let God have first place in our lives? Are we willing to experience the redemptive power of God in our lives? Are we willing to put our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ and make him our Savior, make him our Lord, so that when he comes, we will also be included? in his coming, in that rapture that will snatch God's people out of this world. I trust that indeed the Spirit of God will not leave you uh, until, uh, that is not leave you dis uh, undisturbed until you say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ and make him your Savior, make him your Lord. Recently I came across a little poem that I'm going to read it for you uh, as we bring our thoughts to a close. Uh, a little poem that uh, shows up the kind of person that our Lord Jesus Christ really was and is. He is God manifested in the flesh. Whether we like to uh, believe that or not, the Bible supports that, that he is very God, although he became very man. But he was willing to lay all his glory aside, all the wonderful things that we know he was responsible for and the miracles that he did. Jesus was willing to just lay it aside as though not taking credit for any of this. 
and he was willing to just carry out his father's will. The little poem says, how, long, how low did Christ stoop? That is, when he came to earth. How low a step did he take? The master, as man for man, was made a curse. The claims of laws which he had made, unto the utmost he paid. His holy fingers made the bow which grew the thorns which crowned his brow. The nails that pierced his hands were mined in secret places he designed. He made the forests from whence there sprung the tree on which his body hung. He died upon a cross of wood, yet made the hill on which it stood. The sky that darkened o'er his head, by him above the earth was spread. The sun that hid from him its face, by his decree was poised in space. The spear that spilled his precious blood was tempered in the fires of God. The grave in which his form was laid was hewn in the rock his hands had made. The throne on which he now appears was his from everlasting years. But a crown now rests upon his brow, and every knee to him shall bow. Bow your heads with me, please. We serve such a wonderful God, such a mighty God. He deserves all the celebrations that we can muster, that we can plan. He deserves all the love that we can give. He deserves it all. He deserves our faithfulness. He deserves our worship, our praise, our thanksgiving. I'm going to take a moment and thank the Lord for all that he has done for us and for his wonderful salvation that he has made possible to us. There are some of us sitting here today, we are here because we know Jesus Christ as our Savior. We are here seated because we know we're on our way to heaven. We know that our sins have been forgiven. We know that when Jesus died on the cross, he died for us and he cleansed us with his own precious blood and he gave to us eternal life just like the Bible says he would. There are some of us like that. And we thank God for those who have put their faith in him. But there are some of our friends who are with us today. You're troubled. You're disturbed in your spirit because you haven't yet surrendered your life to this person called Jesus, who is the very Son of God and God the Son, the one who paid the price of your sin on the cross of Calvary. You haven't bowed your heart to him. You have not surrendered your life to him. You have not said to him, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and change me. Make me a child of the living God. You haven't heeded his invitation. But today, God by his Holy Spirit is again speaking to you and he's giving you an opportunity, another opportunity to say yes. Yes, Lord, I want you to save me. If this is so, I'm going to ask you right now. If God is tugging at your heartstrings, if God is signaling to you that you need to come and repent of your sin and have his forgiveness and be made ready for heaven, if this is what 
you're experiencing, I'm going to ask you right now. Would you slip your hand up and put it down again? By raising your hand, this is what you're saying. You're saying to me, by raising your hand, pray for me, brother. Pray for me, preacher. I want Jesus to be my Savior. I want him to be my Lord. Just pray for me that I will make a full surrender to him today. Would you do that? Just by an upraised hand and put it down again. We'll see you. But better yet, God will see you. Jesus will see you. And he will meet your greatest need. Last call. Father God, we thank you. Thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus. Thank you for every thought we have of him. Thank you, our God, for the fact that you sent him many years ago to this sin-cursed world to die for the likes of us. Lord, sometimes we can hardly understand it. Your love for us in spite of all that we have been and if we have done against your will, against your teaching. But our God, we thank you for giving us another chance, the privilege of repenting of our sin and making peace with you. Oh God, we pray for our brothers, our sisters, our, our children, our parents. We pray for those family members who do not know you yet as their Savior and Lord. We pray that even today will be a turning point in their lives. And so we commit them to you right now. Grant that your Holy Spirit will not give them any rest until they say yes to the pleading voice of our blessed Lord. Thank you again, our God, for giving us this privilege to preach the gospel as the power of God unto salvation to those who believe. Receive of our thanksgiving we offer right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.